All right, and it looks like we are live here today. Welcome back, everybody, to the Daily Digital, um, the one show that keeps you all up to date on what's going on in the digital world around us. Uh, I am your host, Junior, and I would like to first get started here mentioning uh, a few things that we're going to talk about here today. First thing is going to be DAOs. Uh, the next thing is going to be how we are um, transitioning as lawyers into a more web three metaverse type world the next thing after that is going to be uh what exactly is a social graph i'm not sure if you heard of that before but facebook slash meta has been talking about it a lot and then the last thing is going to be um all about video games so thanks for everyone for joining me here today um i say the date today is the 23rd of july uh 2022 and we'll jump right into it Okay, so the first thing that we have here today are DAOs. And if you don't know what a DAO is, it is just basically a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, the way that I like to explain exactly what a DAO is, is kind of like a nonprofit organization. Um, and the reason why I like to explain it like that is because DAOs are all about people who are like minded. Um, basically joining in to create a community around what they believe in. Um, and that's really what the DAO is essentially all about. Um, the only thing about a DAO that makes it different, in my opinion, from these nonprofit organizations is that they all are based on like blockchain and cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Um, so let's see here. I've got this website from DSO.org. If you haven't heard of DSO before, uh, check out one of my previous episodes where I talk about DSO. I think that was like last or this past Tuesday or whatever. And uh, DSO is just uh, stands for decentralized uh, social. Um, so yeah, let's see. Uh, while each of these waves have brought in millions of new users and stuff like that, a new wave to take off this year is decentralized autonomous organizations, aka DAOs. Um, what exactly is a DAO? It's important to start off by understanding that the concept of DAO actually isn't new at all. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so here we go. Brief description of what a DAO is. It's just a group of people working collaboratively, collaboratively toward a common mission using cryptocurrency as a coordination, coordinate, coordination tool. Sorry. Uh, beyond this brief description, we believe that the easiest way to fully comprehend what a DAO is and how it actually works by providing an end-to-end -end walkthrough. So I'm gonna go through here, um, just briefly run over how a DAO actually works. First off, you have to understand what your mission is. Again, everybody who joins in on your DAO, no matter uh, if it's about music or if it's about artwork or whatever, uh, they have to understand that, hey, what you're getting yourself into is this. The next part about that is about the capital that's going to start funding these DAOs. Then you're going to trade the DAO currency um, onto the blockchain. You're going to add some governance, meaning some voting power and stuff like that, um, socializing and then distributions. So number one, at heart of any DAO is a, is a shared mission that all of those participants are working towards. There are many different types of missions that DAOs can rally around, but more often than not, the most compelling DAO tend to have a mission that is capital intensive. Um, they have collectible DAOs. The most straightforward avenue for disruption through DAOs is allow for the fractionalization of big ticket collectible items. Constitution DAOs was the higher bringer of this trend, but if we play out the mechanics, uh, DAOs can be used to purchase almost anything, including works of art, which is from the Picasso DAO, trading cards like the Pokey DAO, and movie memorabilia like the Potter DAO. Uh, so these are all DAOs that are actually around already. Um, they have movie DAOs, they have VC DAOs, um, community DAOs, service DAOs, um, so on and so forth. The next part is the capital. Once the idea is established, people can invest capital into the DAO in exchange for coins or NFTs that represent ownership into the DAO and which provide them governance rights. Next up is trading. Um, once the user has a DAO coin, they are able to exchange it back for another currency uh, or 
Bitcoin using another decentralized exchange or a centralized exchange. Um, a lot of people probably have heard of Coinbase before if you're into cryptocurrency, but maybe not Uniswap because Uniswap is a more decentralized exchange, uh, which I probably should do a show on that. But the difference between a centralized and a decentralized exchange is um, that the centralized one, for example, if you lose your public key or secret key, um, there's a chance that you can get it back just by doing a KYC um, portion of it. Um, and then, but for the decentralized side, um, if you lose your key, it's, <laughs> there's, there's nothing else to it. Uh, so think of renting a house versus buying a house. Uh, if you rent a house, then you have a key and your landlord probably has a key also. So therefore, if you ever lose your key, you can just go to the landlord and say, hey, landlord, I lost my key. Please let me in. Make me a new copy. Uh, but to your own house, if you lose your key, well, that's you're just SOL. You're going to have to just take off that actual um, door handle and replace it with a new door handle with a brand new key. Um, so there's that. Uh, governance. Once a DAO has raised a treasury, the actions of the DAO can be controlled by a vote of the coin holders. The fact that a DAO makes key managerial decisions by voting rather than solely by the discretion of a centralized entity is a key property that distinguishes a DAO from a traditional invested entity. Uh, step number five is socializing. DAOs are social by nature. Once members join in, in a DAO, they need to be able to see which other members are also in the DAO and to communicate with them about DAO related topics. Uh, and then lastly here we have distributions. Once a DAO is allocated as funds, it can then generate cash flows off of its assets. This can be used to reward holders of the coin or to compensate people who are doing work to help advance the DAO. Um, so again, if in my opinion, if you kind of breeze through this, it is pretty much just like a nonprofit um, organization. You do have people who basically work for free um, towards a common goal. Uh, they, they, they build capital by donations and investments. Um, they don't do any portion of the trading part of it. Um, they do have governance. They do um, vote and stuff like that as well. They do need to communicate with each other, of course, and then distributions. Um, of course, if the nonprofit ends up making uh, a lot of money in the donations, the people that's running it, they still have lives to live, so they end up quitting their main job and then taking on the organization, nonprofit organization, full time, and they need to, you know, be compensated for that. Um, so some of the um, funds for the nonprofit goes to them, just like in this DAO. Some of the funds can be paid out to the um, coin holders and such. Um, DAO ecosystem overview: We have a couple of what they call protocol DAOs. Um, Sushi, Uniswap again here, uh, Maker, uh, they have some service DAOs, DX DAO, uh, Metafactory, um, Social DAOs, uh, we have 8 DAO, Seed Club, um, Pleasure, uh, Media DAOs like Bankless and Decrypt, Grants, um, Uniswap Grant, Mint Fund, and so on and so forth. Uh, why are DAOs important? Well. Um, it really is up to the user, in my opinion, why people think DAOs are important. Um, again, if you think of nonprofit organizations, that would be one, one thing there. Um, but th in my opinion, the main thing about it is that uh, I think they have it actually here. Um, it creates greater access for individuals. So I'll, I'll run through this real quick. Uh, DAOs allow for greater flexibility to workers. Um, so, for example, if you want to join some sort of organization, um, you have to go through a long vetting process. It starts from like searching for it, interviewing for it, going through another interview, phone interview, what have you. And then, you know, um, uh, actually working, training and all that stuff is a big onboarding process with these DAOs. It kind of um, removes that aspect of it. So uh, DAOs disrupt this model by allowing members of the global workforce to join and leave an organization at will. In fact, some people may choose to work for multiple DAOs part time uh, to diversify their interests. This allows for easier migration of workers and for talented people to pursue work that they actually care about. Um, DAOs create greater access for individuals, as we mentioned in our um, this the concept of owning a multi million dollar ticket item was something that was historically been out of reach for the average individual but with tokenized ownership 
everyone can easily own a part of an expensive item or project, which is a big, big thing in my opinion. Um, DAOs also remove borders. Um, talent and capital is spread throughout the world, but the but with the uh, existing model, it's current. It's difficult to bring people into an organization that don't live near the headquarters, as the name suggests. DAOs are inherently decentralized. Um, so yeah, so if you get if you ask, if you uh, again, if you guys have not heard of DAOs before. Um, but if you do check out DAOs, if you've been thinking about starting up your own, um, quote unquote, nonprofit or something like that, look into doing a DAO instead. Um, in my opinion, it'll provide you a whole lot more because you get to turn your uh, DAO, get a DAO coin, um, get in cryptocurrency, get into cryptocurrency, um, build that wealth for it, um, and so on and so forth. All right, so the next thing that we have here is about a social graph. So if you haven't heard of social graph before, um, it's really just a graph of your social standings, I should say. Um, so I'm going to give you real quick my take on it. Uh, if you say, for example, have a Facebook account, and let me see, I think they have a... Um, I mean, this is not the greatest. I'm trying to see if I have a better graph here of a social graph. All right, so here's just a like kind of like a real quick um, example of what I think a social graph, especially with social media, what it looks like. I mean, the whole big thing around it is that all of these different companies they are accessing data about you that you may not even know that you're sharing with them. Um, Twitter is accessing data from you. LinkedIn is accessing data from you. Instagram, Facebook, they're all accessing your data. Um, and you know, some of them may be sharing it or selling it to the highest bidder. Um, but with that, you end up having them being the sole, um, uh, what's it called? Like the, this, I won't call it the middleman, but they're essentially the owners of all that data. So Twitter doesn't share information with LinkedIn. So anytime you say, hey, my name is Junior and I like to cook or something like that, you have to tell Twitter that, you have to tell LinkedIn that, you have to tell Instagram that. So your social graph ends up becoming more centralized around every single social media account that you may have. Um, I'm going to click on this here. Um, so this one says, hey, this is Bob. He drives a BMW. He's the brother of Steve. He's married to Julie. Um, um, Julie is a sister-in-law to Steve in that case. Uh, Julie listens to rock music. Bob also listens to rock music. So you can kind of see how this graph starts to play out um, with Bob being right there at the center. Um, the thing about it, though, is that Bob is no longer at the center in the case of when it comes to like social media and stuff. Um, but in Web3 world, once everything becomes more decentralized, when everything goes on to the blockchain, guess what? Bob now actually does become the center of attention again because Bob him himself will actually own his own information. He'll own his own data. He, everything will be in his trust wallet or what have you. Um, and then anytime any platform wants to know what kind of music Bob listens to, they would have to contact Bob directly. You know, so that's the power of this um, Web3 decentralized world that we're transitioning into is that we no longer have to um, share multiple information with all of these different um, uh, platforms and stuff like that. We can actually just go ahead and share it once and actually have control over what we do share. Uh, what we don't want to share will be locked and secured on our wallet, uh, whether it be on chain or off chain at the time. And uh, so let's see, for instance, you may have noticed recently that everything you listen to on Spotify is shared with your friends and you can also see what music they are listening to too. Spotify was one of the early apps to tap into the Facebook open graph platform, which Facebook introduced in fall. So basically Spotify <laughs> tapped into Facebook's data that Facebook grabbed from you to know what you're listening to and what your friends are listening to 
and then Spotify said, hey, we're going to share the same music with you to kind of curate exactly your listening uh, needs. Um, in my opinion, I have a slight problem with this. Well, maybe more than a slight problem with this um, because, you know, for one, I like to listen to all genres of music. And if you're just only sending me rock music, rock music, rock music, rock music, I'm never going to be able to listen to any other kind of music because you think I only want to listen to rock music. I don't. Leave me alone. <laughs> I want to listen to what I want to listen to. And thank you very much. Uh, another thing is, again, like what if I don't want to share what I'm listening to to other people? Don't I have the right to say so? You know, so um, the open graph. Uh, the open graph style is just the latest expansion of Facebook social graph. Um, basically, Facebook wants to take everything you do online and put that onto Facebook. Uh, it does this by seeing you as a user, identifying an action, whatever that you're doing, and then publishing it as an object. Um, so yeah, so you, the user, say you cook, and then they're going to just in format advertisement send you a recipe so that you can cook whatever recipe they send you basically um so yeah and that's why i want to kind of mention social graphs just so that we're all aware of what's going on behind the scenes with facebook and all these other companies every pretty much every company is doing it uh, that's how they you know make money um, they're free because they sell advertisements and those advertisements are basically curated to you and every time you click on one of those advertisements, it gives them even more money. So, but in order for you to click on it, you have to actually, you know, like the advertisement itself. Um, so this is here, just another website that I found um, by uh, CyberConnect. So CyberConnect is doing something, is using ceramic to connect everyone in Web3. Uh, I'm actually going to look more into CyberConnect. I might have to do like a separate show on them alone, um, just as like a topic or whatever. Um, but CyberConnect seems to be one of those companies that's like taking this social graph thing here uh, to the next level. So that so using ceramic, CyberConnect is building a new decentralized social graph protocol. This critical piece of Web3 infrastructure is blockchain agnostic and openly accessible for developers to build decentralized social networks and other apps on the metaverse. Uh, we want to get that listed on the CyberConnect. Follow the team on Twitter. Uh, the downfalls of today's gated social network. Um, the current landscape of Web2 filled with centralized social networks has deviated from the principle of the World Wide Web, namely to enable decentralization of information on a large scale um, cyber connect protocol so yeah you guys can read through this more uh, I'm not going to like go full all in on this right now and you know, I just wanted to make sure I share this with you all so that you know that your data your information is being used you know it's I mean it's for your benefit I can, I can say that's for your benefit um, but you should have the right to say whether you want it to be used for that or not uh, in my opinion uh, Universal Social Graph Index. Uh, what's next for Cyber Connect? All that good stuff here. Uh, with Cyber Chat. Oh, so they want to do like a Cyber Chat thing, which is pretty nice um, to connect people and stuff like that as well. So, yeah, um, definitely let me know what you guys think about Cyber Connect and what you think about the whole social graph thing and as a whole. Um, it is a term that I am actually finding out a lot of people don't know about. Um, and they don't even know that, you know, Facebook is kind of, again, for your benefit, pushing some advertisements your way. Uh, but by, you know, sharing that advertisement for um, for you as well, or sharing your data in order to get access to those advertisements. Um, so what I see on my Facebook is a whole lot different from what you see on your Facebook and so on and so forth, because everything is curated to our social graph, our user ability and stuff like that. All right, so the next portion here is about lawyers. How did you become a blockchain lawyer? So you guys must have known it was going to come eventually. Um, you're gonna need to have to protect yourself. Uh, so blockchain lawyer, there have only been a few years of blockchain technology. However, technology is now being used for everything, including giving digital identity and holding virtual currency, as well as recording transactions. Uh, due to blockchain technology, business 
businesses and individuals are changing how they conduct online transactions. Although the technology brings up new possibilities, there are still many unanswered questions. Because of this, federal organizations, including the SEC, IRS, and the CFTC, have stepped into to oversee the blockchain industry. Um, so how does blockchain lore offer opportunities? Well, here we go. Um, blockchain platform companies, traders, cryptocurrency investors should exercise caution and seek legal counsel before doing any actions that can subject them to civil or criminal liability. Uh, because of the aforementioned, a new era of law is beginning to emerge. Blockchain lawyers are attorneys who advise clients who employ distributed ledger technology, create their own cryptocurrency, utilize them, or incorporate them into their business processes. Uh, there are many opportunities for attorneys in the cryptocurrency industry to advocate best practices and make sure that the that an innovative and disruptive blockchain initiative adhere to uh, establish legal frameworks attorneys can contribute their knowledge in the following areas of the blockchain and cryptocurrency community uh so before i mention those i just want to say that this will be or in my opinion this will be a new like a whole new wave of um uh of degrees coming out of college uh they're going to be like blockchain specific or web3 metaverse um you know whatever whatever specific lawyers that who are going to really understand that space um and um, in my opinion it's going to be a lot of younger people who are really into all of that as well um, because you can't take you know what's done in the past and just simply patch it to what's coming you know you have to kind of reshape and reformulate everything uh, and that also means to reformulate the mind of the person who is actually going through it um, and reshaping how they think about certain things um, so what people can do, they can be consultants. So blockchain lawyers will represent a wide range of clients, um, including large corporations, um, private citizens uh, interested in cryptocurrencies. The goal of the attorney is to assist these potential clients in creating a legal roadmap for corporate governance and other difficulties because they are typically uh, starting from scratch and it comes to understanding the legal requirements of the uh, crypto space uh, policy development so you can start to develop different policies that come around with uh, what 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 happens with some of this stuff the need for developing policies is most pressing when it comes to recently emerging technologies like blockchain it is well known that the governments often adopt new technologies slowly this is especially in the u.s oh my gosh they are so behind on times uh, it is still conceivable to offer this service to businesses who are primarily concerned with creating legal frameworks. Government tracking due to the dynamic nature of blockchain technology, new laws or policies pertaining to its regulation are frequently being passed somewhere in the world. It is crucial to keep an up-to-date ex examination of these laws because blockchain technology is now shrouded in significant legal ambiguity. Compliance. Before conducting blockchain or cryptocurrency activities, firms may be required to some nations to get uh, licenses. Uh, a project's need for a license may depend on the legal status of a coin of a token. For instance, if a token is recognized as a utility in some areas, it wouldn't need a license to function. However, if the token is regarded as a security, the issuing company would require a license. Um, so this is something that maybe a lot of people who are starting out with these different NFTs and stuff like that uh, may not know. They may need a license for it because it's, they're doing a security rather than just a simple utility. Um, litigations in the past four years, there has been reportedly been a fourfold increase in the number of court actions concerning blockchain technology and its impl implementations. Blockchain attorneys can represent businesses and people in regulatory body investigations and inquiries um, in civil criminal cases and so on and so forth um, so yeah so let me know what you guys think about that there um, I myself am not a lawyer never ever ever thought about becoming a lawyer but there may be some people out there who are looking to become a lawyer or want to transition from what they're doing now into something a little bit different this right here, I feel like is really going to be a booming, booming business for some people. Um, you can even create a DAO. There we go. Create a DAO about um, 
all of that stuff and then just, you know, have a DAO full of lawyers, um, people who are actually love cryptocurrency, want to see it grow, want to see people uh, actually use it the right way and benefit from it um, and don't want people to get hurt because of it and stuff like that because there's a lot of people that's getting scammed out there. Um, so, yeah, definitely take a look at becoming a lawyer or if you know someone who might be great at becoming a lawyer, think about going to college for it. Just let them know, hey, you might want to think into uh, this new emerging technology that's coming up into play um, and becoming a lawyer for that because, I mean, there's nobody doing it. Nobody doing it right now. So next up here, we have Open3DE. So this is Open3D Engine. It is a game engine. And the reason why I wanted to mention this uh, is because this here is owned by Amazon. It's created by Amazon. It used to be called, I think it started with an L. Where is it at? Um, Lumberyard. So back in July, we, so this this was out in December 2021. So July 2021, uh, the developer preview release of Open3DE, the successor to Amazon Lumberyard as a founding member company of the Linux Foundation recently launched Open3D Foundation. Um, <clears throat> so what this basically, so this is, again, this is for the gamers out there, uh, and for the indie, indie game, um, developers, uh, you know, any game developer out there, Amazon, you wouldn't think would be getting into the gaming industry. Uh, but as you know, with their Amazon prime and stuff, you can watch movies from them. Uh, I did another episode before about Amazon on, um, uh, they have a hair salon out in London, I think it was. Um, so Amazon is really expanding. Amazon is really taking things to the next level when it comes to like all this digital technology. Um, so I'm not actually surprised at all why they would be getting into game engines um, because game engines are essentially how the metaverse is created. A lot of people don't know that, um, but um, Unreal Engine and Unity are the two major players in that. Uh, another one that knows real big is Godot, G-O-D-O-T, I believe. Um, and essentially, you can use those platforms to you know, help create the metaverse. All these different websites and stuff like that uh, are being used from that as well. Um, so Amazon is like right on track with, uh, with everything here. Um, you can create AAA games with it. Um, these are like the highest rated games there. Uh, built for extensibility, integrate your with your favorite cloud services. I wonder what cloud services they're thinking of. Um, uh, our community is built on a community of conjunction of dedicated members. All that good stuff. Get started with O3DE. Um, we'll download it. Um, so yeah, so I mean, they, they, they look to be, and I just want to, so um, they bought it from CryEngine, I believe. Um, Cry Engine, you can kind of do a little bit of research from them there. They created the game Far Cry, um, which is actually, I think I, I think I played Far Cry number four or something like that. They, it was actually a pretty good game. Um, the game that came out from Amazon, I'm trying to think of what that game was called. Um, it was actually a, it's actually a new game. It came out in 2022. I have to do some research and check it, but uh, it's a game that just came out from Amazon that actually built on that platform. That was it was a decent game from what I heard. Um, it just it just kind of lacked in the uh, storytelling part of it, though. Let me see if I can just do a quick research on that. All right, yeah. So I couldn't find. I just did like a real quick two minute search for it. I couldn't really find the game. Um, that was created on O3DE, or maybe this New World one here. Um, yeah, I think it might be New World, but you, as you can see here, Crucible is a game um, came out on Amazon's Lumber Yard uh, back in 2020, um, but it wasn't until 2021 where they open sourced Lumber Yard and called it Open 3DE, um, and, uh, and basically allowing people to go ahead and use it to build their own games and stuff like that. So um, definitely let me know what you guys think of that here. Um, appreciate your time um, listening to all of these different te technology uh, things that have been shaping our digital world. Uh, if you're thinking about creating a DAO, I would love to hear about it. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff that's been going around the world um, as far as like DAOs and stuff like that. And I'm, uh, I'm actually pretty interested to see how far these DAOs can be taken. Uh, I myself would like to open one or start one one day uh, or even join in on one one day as well. So um, as long as it, you know, matches with my interests and everything. Um, and if you are a open game developer or indie game developer, check out the open source uh, Amazon O3DE platform um, to create your game and, uh, uh, you know, share it. Let me know what to think. Um, all right. So without any further ado, that is all I have here for today. Please do check out all of the links in the description below. And as always, check in with me on social media. You guys have a good one.